un, deux, trois. I have lynx and wooden head. Hwa. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowley. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. Spoiler alert, we're in 2021 and it's already kind of crazy. So we're kicking off the year, Happy New Year by the way, babe, with Cole's Choice. So we're at episode 149, back to you, what are we talking about today? Well, we are here on the first snowy day of the year in Austin, possibly literally the only snowy day we will have. That's what I was just about to say after you said first. And it's such a wonderful atmosphere outside, and we are kicking off 2021, like you said. So for our first film of the new year, I wanted to start with something that hopefully will set a tone of magic and wonder and exploration. So I have chosen Celine and Julie Go Boating, subtitle Phantom Ladies Over Paris, from 1974. And that's directed by Jacques Rivette and starring Dominique Laborier and Juliette Berto. It's about a daydreaming librarian and a kind of chaotic stage magician who become fast friends and find themselves enmeshed in a time loop mystery that plays with memory, identity, and intimacy in a way that's unlike very many things that you've probably seen before. You know what's a great feeling to have? What's that? When you discover that something has arrived on your doorstep you didn't know that you had been waiting for, and that's how I feel about this film. Now, how did you first see it, and what number of viewing are you on? Well, I'm glad you feel that way about it, first of all. And this is the third time that I've watched it, this time that we just watched it together. I first saw this on the big screen with our friend Merritt at Austin Film Society several years ago. And I think it was a great benefit to see it that way the first time. It really enhanced certain themes and the tone. It's almost an experience that requires you to sit very close to the screen, not to see better, but so that it almost wraps around you to the point of distorting what you see. And I know you hate the front row. Yes, it is God's most terrible invention. (laughs) And if I have my choice, I always typically want to sit at the back, but I saw Antichrist that way the first time I saw it at Fantastic Fest because I barely got in and that was the only seat left was the one on the end of the very front row. Typical Cole Rolaine going back to our first in love date. That was totally different than this. This was festival time and so I have no choice about the matter. I only got in when I could get in. The other one I take full responsibility for. But seeing it that way, this off-kilter angle combined with festival fatigue because I was on day eight, I think, of Fantastic Fest at that point, it made that a viewing that had a very specific effect on me, almost physical, in part particularly because of those viewing conditions. I love that idea of wanting to lean in closer to the screen. For me, it's all about those times as a kid and an adult when I lean in because I'm so wrapped up in the story, I somehow want to figure out faster what's going to happen next. If you sit that close to the TV, you're going to ruin your eyes. That's true. And I do wish I had seen this on the big screen. I don't say that about everything because, you know, I dislike the theater going experience these days just because of other people in true Jean-Paul Sartre (laughs) manner. But I do wish that I had gotten that experience. Hopefully I will again someday. I can practically guarantee that you will, because the Criterion Collection has announced this as an upcoming selection of theirs, and typically that also means, potentially, Janice will be touring a print. So it, hopefully, if we can go to theaters again sometime soon, will be out there for us to go and sit and watch together. Okay, wait a second. I'm going to alter that wish, and I'm going to say, I hope I get to see it at the Cinémathèque Française. And I won't even need subtitles this time, because I've seen it so many times, I know what's happening. Well, before we get into the movie exactly, let's talk a little bit about how it was developed. 
Because it's a pretty interesting process, it seems like. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think so. The method of creation, I feel like, is crucial to the tone and the content of the film, too. It feels a little similar to Mike Lee and his method of developing the screenplay through extended improvisatory rehearsals, though this seems more pleasingly manic a process than Lee's. Lee's process seems like honing, plumbing some traumatic depths sometimes, trying and discarding things until you arrive at exactly what tells the story best and no more. This doesn't feel like as potentially punishing a process as Lee's seems like sometimes. And at least for a lot of Mike Lee movies, this result isn't quite as doer, I would say. And it also still ends up feeling like it was a fairly improvisational process, at least captured on film, which is not entirely accurate. And I think that that is a wonderful testament to the acting ability. Yeah, if I were to compare the two, Rivette's process for this This film in particular, at least, it seems like it's just spinning out in multiple directions, throwing everything at the wall. And I don't mean to imply that Rivette's process is the lesser or has less gravity because it results in more fun more often. They both produce remarkable results. It's just apples and oranges. Right. Rivette is not less rigorous, for example, and the editing itself is very key and quite rigorous, because when we start to build the story layer upon layer and we examine what we have at the end, you realize there were no accidents. And I also want to mention how cool it is that the actors are also credited as co-writers. So Le Bourrier and Berto, and then Boulle Augier and Pizier, who are two of the ghosts in the ghost house, they also contributed. Well, let's get to the film and talk about how this manifests itself. We start literally begin with the on-screen text. Usually, it began like this, dot, dot, dot. Rivette is already subverting expectations. I love, I can't tell you how much I love that literally the very first word in this is opening the door for ambiguity and multiple story paths. And it continues to pay off in many satisfying ways over and over again. For me, a lot of that is because... One of the most exciting things I find about Celine and Julie's interplay is how much it all values imagination. They're never locked into the narrative in an inescapable way. They are constantly poised at the edge of, what if we tried this? As both actors and characters, and I feel that is a direct extension of the way Rivette makes movies. There's a moment in one of the iterations that they're playing out when... Julie is kind of hustling to get to the right place at the right time. And I love that it seems like so many things could go wrong. And speaking of the way Rivette makes movies like I just was, we should warn the uninitiated. Jacques Rivette takes his time saying things. You cannot rush it. The way he does things in the space that he occupies in the French New Wave is kind of unique. And it really does make me lean toward him as my favorite, especially with his tendency to experiment and how what he made were among the most challenging things to come out of that movement. I feel ultimately like Godard's experiments were much more formal and rigid and they don't move me emotionally the same way. They're not as much fun. To be fair, I guess I should say, I don't think Godard was trying to have a lot of fun a lot of the time. So it might be an unfair standard to try to hold him to. But as far as what appeals to me, Just Rivette's use of time felt more audacious, and I like long, slow things. That's what she said. (laughs) (laughs) Said no one ever. Out One, his longest film, is nearly 13 hours long in its unedited form. They later put out a four-hour version of it, but if you want the true unedited form as he intended, it's almost 13 hours. I've read in a lot of places that Celine and Julie is a good place to start for Rivette neophytes, which is the camp that I'm in, and it does seem like a great place. I don't want to somehow suggest that we're coming down either way on how accessible or not this is. I was thinking about that a lot in the last week or so, and I just want to steer clear of that because I feel like it gives nobody credit. Well, I'm going to come down in a camp that I think it is very specifically accessible compared to some of the other films, obviously compared to 13 hours. That's true. That's a good point. 
If you take out his final feature film, which was a tidy 89 minutes, the average runtime of his other 19 features was three hours and 20 minutes, which is exactly what Celine and Julie is. It certainly doesn't feel that way. I guess I just don't want to do any kind of special pleading to say to people, yes, give it a chance because it's super duper fun. I don't want to depict it that way either, but I do want to say it's an investment. You put that time in and you certainly are rewarded. So I think I feel a little bit of that about it. And the thing that it really points me to is that I love how much he was not inclined to compromise his vision. He made what he wanted to make, however long that took. And that's not to say he wasn't a good collaborator. Those are two different ideas. You can see the spontaneity in Celine and Julie's faces. They light up when they seize upon an idea that excites them. And Rivette gave them a lot of leeway on set and in those rehearsals. And like you say, he reeled things in later during the editing process, which is where it could have gone really wrong, probably. The unbridled playfulness and fun, it makes for a very good film. But then you add that judicious editing to impose just enough order on the story. That's what makes it a great film. I personally love that lazy summer feeling and the exploration of Paris as just one big maze. And there are enough holes, as they call them, and ambiguity. It allows for our own interpretation rather than feeling like we have a shoddy product. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It's a very specific kind of movie magic, but not in the typical way we think of that. I have a little bit more about that later, actually. I guess where I was going with that is there are some films where you might think they are too challenging or possibly the filmmakers hadn't done enough work thinking about their own idea. This to me is a totally different animal. There's a total method to the madness and I think that makes multiple viewings incredibly interesting and I can't see it ever being a dull process. Exactly. When we get back to the movie proper, we see that because right away... We're through the looking glass before we are even on our feet, it feels like. We begin with the moment, similar to the appearance of the White Rabbit in Alice in Wonderland, when this captivating figure runs through the scene and drops her sunglasses. The other woman in the park picks them up and begins to chase her, intent on returning them. But this chase, it quickly takes on a quality of playfulness, something else, something even familiar. And it made me wonder what questions did you have about these opening moments? Because to me, it immediately seemed deeper than just returning someone's lost item. I was thinking, did they know each other? Is this a game that they play often? Are they best friends, partners in crime? How did all that strike you right away? So I assumed by the key title cards that this was something of a game. I wasn't sure if they knew each other or if they were basically just waiting for each other in terms of having a like-minded soul to play with that somehow happens into your life. Because in a lot of ways, this reminds me of my friendship with my great pal, Darcy. It seems like something we would have had fun doing or probably did a version of this. Well, I'm glad that you bring that up, your personal experience with that, because the next thing that occurs to me, this chase being a theme that recurs again and again, it goes on to such a length as to possibly bear my suspicions out, your suspicions too. To be so fascinated with someone that you do this, that you just take up and follow them, this kind of pursuit or cat and mouse, does it only work if it's two women? Because if this were a man following a woman so intently, there might be a sense of menace with that. That could be conveyed playfully too, I guess. But it's a very specific solidarity and give and take that I feel between these two characters. I was thinking about that idea with a bit of a different angle. I just randomly started thinking about the movie in my car, and it made me think a lot about, okay, what if this were two men? I guess I didn't really go down the man-woman angle. I was thinking more of a friendship with two men. Imagine watching two men sitting together on that trunk and giggling and touching and having a great time. I don't feel like there's a construct today that this would have been carried out successfully. And it doesn't seem like it it would have become genderless, for example. Do you mean that in the sense that audiences would be too uncomfortable with the homoerotic overtones? They would be too distracted by something that they don't see often enough. Mm, Okay. 
So I guess my answer to those questions, I think, yes, it only works if it's two women. And yes, it works best when it's two women. But that's not because of the inherent strengths of the material, but because of the inherent weaknesses of the audience. I don't want to necessarily just put that on the audience because that comes back to the product that we are given, really. That's all that we have to view. So I think it's the larger piece. And I do think it works well with something that I do feel like Rivette is showing us here, which is two women putting something over on the patriarchy sometimes. So not only is it two women, but it's two women that don't have a fixation on a relationship, for example, or on their own bodies. It's just about something completely different than I would say most of us are used to. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Like you point out, Laborie and Berto and the other women in the ghost house sequence, they were all given those writing credits. Like you say, the story was largely devised by women, and I think that's palpable. But the next morning, as they often say, we discover that at least one of them isn't necessarily given to this sort of whirlwind, catch-as-catch-can experience. Julie is a librarian. It implies an orderly, sedate life. Now, you and I both work in libraries. Does this hit home to you? Are you more of a Julie or a Celine? I think I'm more of a Julie. I don't think you could see me changing clothes in the middle of the street as I go with the bag full of my disguises, essentially. And at the same time, what I like about this librarianship is it is incredibly accurate. You're doing whatever the hell under the desk where nobody can see and then just taking time to uh, mark books up. I know you and one of your library pals are always talking about Grand Theft Auto when you're at work, right? Do you have more of an affinity with one of the characters? And do you also think that this portrait of librarianship is accurate? One, it is accurate. Two, I like to think of myself as more of a Julie in the streets and a Celine in the sheets. (laughs) Sounds true. But that is even malleable because we soon see... Nobody's a dud. Right. The borders separating their lives, they become more and more porous as we go. When the hunter becomes the hunted, Celine shows up at the library. The characters soon become so intertwined that it can sometimes feel just like shape-shifting. You're taking on identities as easily as changing a scarf. And that's especially easy for someone like Celine, who is not above stealing anything she wants or needs as she walks down the street on a whim to be a prop or a costume in her ongoing drama. I do want to emphasize, though, they certainly have distinct personalities. So how much stock then do you put in the suggestion that the movie occasionally makes that they are interchangeable because we see them swap out for one another in this house at the center of the movie's mystery on stage doing magic with a former lover that you would think might notice the switch and then ultimately switching places as the whole process possibly begins anew in the final moments. I do not think of them as interchangeable. I do take away the character that they become inside of the house drama. I look at that as something a little bit different. So if we talk about them in quote unquote real life, I thought that this was a little bit more of a device of examining the theatricality of the story. Because when they're playing each other or playing a character like the other, it seems like more of an element of fun or a riddle. It seems like it's something that's specifically played in those moments as putting one over on the stiffs who don't seem to know the difference. Because, for example, when Julie goes in to basically do her cabaret act, it's nothing like what Celine had done. Well, then how do you qualify the difference, for instance? How does that affect the way you perceive them because they become even more intertwined once they are co-participants in this mutual dream, once they are sharing the candy and viewing the scene in the house as a unit. I think intertwined is the key word, and that's completely different than interchangeable. That, to me, suggests this idea that I was talking about before, that you've been waiting for this other person to come to join you in this grand adventure. You didn't know that you were waiting for them. And then so it only works when they come together. I love that idea because it's exactly what I was about to say. Oh, I think fantastic. They are great complements to one another. And it makes me fully understand how important it is that there are two of them 
rather than this being a solo adventure like the aforementioned Alice in Wonderland. It's all about the act of storytelling, basically. And by definition, that requires at least two people, one being the teller of the tale and one being the audience. And it's okay if those roles are fluid. It's better, in fact, in this case. But like you say, you can't do this sort of thing by yourself. And then it's also equally important to have a sounding board to develop the plan in response to what they are experiencing in the house. Yes, I'm totally with you. Because how much fun is it to be able to get your chance to take the other role? It's so much more fun than having to play the same thing over and over again. One can be Alice that day, the other the White Rabbit, and then you switch. Is this all a prelude to our off, off, off Broadway production of Jekyll and Hyde where you and I switch parts each night? That sounds good. I thought you were going to say The Matrix, which I will be mentioning later <laughs> in the episode. But I truly do believe that they were childhood friends. I think Celine is the girl who moved away when we come later in the story when Julie meets up with her beloved Poopy. I think they were always going to find each other, and I think they're going to keep finding each other. And you're right on the money again, because repetition... Oh, thank you. <laughs> it's a central theme here. They repeat their pursuit of one another. Julie's former love, Gilou, arrives and wants to repeat childhood rituals for real. They make numerous forays into this mysterious house, and those repetitions become more intense and important as they go. We'll see a specific taxi ride again and again. Julie, in particular initially has trouble dealing with the house. She can't remember what took place there. So what else do you do? Start over, repeat it until you figure it out or get it right. Now their early interactions, as they're establishing their relationship, they're a metaphor for what aspects of a relationship do you think? Is this platonic, sibling, romantic? And the latter I mainly ask about because they assume an incredible intimacy right away. And my interpretation of that is partially predicated on how much snooping they're doing. Because if you're digging around in my stuff that much, we better know each other really well. I struggle with the metaphor part. I don't think romantic. I think beyond romantic. And I also don't mean to keep beating this horse. Two halves. Two souls. I mean, unless the metaphor is that we'll repeat and repeat no matter who we are or what role we're playing, so more of a metaphor for our own behavior? I don't know. I haven't really totally thought all of this through. And you're the one with a sibling. Do you feel more of the sibling part of this? I definitely do in the nonverbal communication that happens. Oh, okay. I hadn't thought about that at all. There's very definitely that sibling level of deep understanding that one quick look conveys everything we need to understand. So on that level, I think it operates very well as a sibling relationship. But otherwise, let's just look at the procession. It follows this structure. There is pursuit and meeting, exchanging point of view shots along the way as that happens. And that is followed by actually impersonating each other and examining various facets of each other's lives from the inside. And finally, once that connection is fully established, then they turn their gaze outward and take up with this movie within the movie that takes place in the ghost house. So now they have done the entire spectrum and end up being both watched and the watchers. I think, though, that idea that it's an impersonation starts to break down a little bit because it is Celine, yes, impersonating Julie to an extent, but way more about the character that Guy Lou thinks was there than who actually Julie is. And then Julie is her own character when she takes on that stage show. And then it's about taking on this one role within that whole ghost house drama. And that's based on, I think, sort of two stories from Henry James. Do mm -hmm. I have that right? So inhabiting yet a third character. Yeah, I love that scene when Julie goes to the house and then Celine goes to meet Gilou in the park in her stead. He does not recognize this deception. And I think that's because it's a combination of both eagerness and a willingness to overlook suspicions in the face of her enthusiasm because she is undressing him in the park as they dance together. In the middle of all the school kids assembled and the picnickers, it immediately made me think of that line in Raising Arizona. His kids seemed to think it was funny. <laughs> yeah, everyone in the park is having a great time watching this, whatever it is, unfold. One of the things I wanted to ask you about that I know I didn't get all of 
because of the language barrier, their wordplay. You're the French speaker here, so what can you tell me about it that I might have missed? Unfortunately, not much, because my French speaking days are in the very distant past, and I just don't know enough vocabulary, especially this vocabulary, to be able to spot all of the puns that seem to be happening, so I just have to follow the subtitles. Though there are some things I do know, like the address of the house, set bis, rue de nadir au pomme, which is something like the bottom of the apple, or apple's butt. <laughs> oh, I got apple bottoms. That I understand in any language. Yeah. Then I guess I feel a little like you. The wordplay is at least somewhat obvious with the subtitles. I get the sense of fun they are having with puns and homonyms. But wouldn't it be great that we knew every language and so we could always just have our own jokes at the same time as they're being told to us? Someday, mon petit cabage. <laughs> so at this point, I'm really enjoying, too, getting more into this mystery within a mystery at the ghost house. What exactly is going on? Yeah, I like it, too. They begin discussing the situation in this house where Celine is working, and it is beginning to take on the feeling of a detective story. Going to that house, getting to the bottom of the things, it's taking on a real momentum that I have a lot of fun with. So Julie goes first, and that leaves Celine free for the day to meet Gilou and to do whatever else that she might be doing. Celine is clearly a disruptor, an exaggerator, to put it mildly. We see her after the episode with Gilou. She's meeting her friends, and she's telling them about Julie, sort of, and her new situation with her. Are they so used to this that they routinely just disregard her stories? Here's what's interesting to me, though. If we then think back to the very first story that Celine told us, it was actually true. So is she a disruptor? Yes. I think of her more as a performer than as a pathological liar, for example, <laughs> or a great big flake, because there's at least some truth happening. It seems like they do know her propensities to some degree, so I don't really know. There doesn't seem to be malice no, happening. But you're right. There is some exaggeration. I very much feel like Celine is one of these print the legend types of people. I guess I'm a bigger fan of Sophia Petrillo than Rose Nyland's <laughs> story, so I'll go with uh, Celine's narratives. Well, we talked a little bit at the beginning about movie magic. Typically, that's been in reference to how that is more traditionally exhibited or captured. The way it unmistakably leads us to shared epiphanies sometimes, or it just captures captivating shots that conjure a jaw-dropping sense of wonder. But this is a different type of movie magic. But I want to underline that it is definitely that. It's one that I love just as much. It's one that feels more like taking a simple object, turning it inside out, and then finding this state that was never intended to be. It's an even better use of said object. Well, speaking of stories, if we talk about meeting Julie at the library, she's making up these tales of the tarot that don't exactly exist. So there's all sorts of tales happening here. And while we're on the subject, magic is literally another of the recurring themes. In fact, this magic act that Celine does, it makes me want to go right out right now and buy some flash paper. Now, do you feel there is a specific appeal to the nature of all of that, which is essentially theater which has freed itself from the limitations of the stage? Are they living lives as much as they are performing scenes? What does that feel like to you? I don't think that the point of this is for us to examine their lives. So I'm going to go with theater. And you know, I'm going to definitely respond to that as a theater fan and as a Francophile. I put those two things together. There's something about this sort of Proustian exploration all done in this bohemian style in Paris summer streets, that the whole thing appeals to me. Plus the ultimate cabaret act is thrown in. And I love, again, this idea that you don't know what's behind the curtain until you go looking for it. Think of that moment when they're both inhabiting the same role, and the camera shows us all of these things that we didn't see before. We didn't know the full picture before. Rooms that we didn't even know existed that they're suddenly looking in that there's just so much else to go looking for. Do you feel like in general that that's a detriment to the film? Do you wish it were more realistic, that it was more about examination of lives like Chantal Ackerman, for example? 
No, I love it this way. I think it's great as this Fantasia. And then you have the added benefit of being able to go to the matinee in the ghost house seven shows a week, two on Sundays. <laughs> I thought she would say that. Because the murder mystery part of it, it's a theater of its own of sorts because you're performing the same show over and over again with these little minor variations. Okay, so each time they visit this mystery house and then are expelled by it, on the taxi ride home, they find a candy, a sweet, in their mouth, which turns out to be the key to replaying the events of the house and remembering what happened in there. Do you feel like this is a reference to the value of psychedelic, psychotropic drugs in terms of self-discovery? I think yes, in part. I guess when I started to think about it, it didn't seem like that typical 60s and 70s drug exploration, much more like the eat me or drink me from Lewis Carroll. But if you think about the Lewis Carroll time, that was also a very specific time in history with drug exploration. And if you go back to Celine's persona, the mandragora, that goes to mandrake, which has psychotropic effects. So I guess, yes, it is. It all points back to that time. I think so, too, without a doubt. It is a portal. It is opening your third eye, however you want to describe it. They're not Werther's originals. <laughs> no. And via that method, we also get to see flashbacks to what is happening in this house between another pair of women competing for the attentions and affections of a widower with a young daughter, that daughter being in imminent danger of being murdered. So in this alternate timeline, we really do have a mystery thriller on our hands. But the next morning, as they often say, it's Celine's turn to return to the house. And meanwhile, in Julie's imagination, Gilu has been replaced by the mystery of the house. I don't think there's room enough for those two things. And he eventually protests this confusing treatment and announces that he's joining the Trappists. Poor Gilu. It was never that serious for Julie. Get thee to a nunnery, Gilu. <laughs> and I'm glad to see the back of him anyway. Though, I think that it wasn't on purpose that that character and the widower character in the murder mystery resemble each other to a certain degree. The difference being that in the ghost house, Olivier is being fought over while Gilu is twice kicked to the curb. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't fight over either of them. No offense, Barbette Schroeder. Another thing I wanted to bring up here to see what you thought about. This is often cited as a frustrating viewing experience for people, up there with things like last year at Marion Bad. Pauline Kael, she notoriously walked out of the screening at this at the New York Film Festival, announcing in the theater, mid-show, I'm going to go watch movies instead. Can you hear my Bronx cheer happening <laughs> from all the way on this side? But some people do find it too dry, or too foolish, or too self-aware, or too inside, not populist enough. But I feel like they're cheating themselves by not seeing it through, because by the time we get to this final third, there is just so much fun and joy in this film. These ideas and the way that they are presented, they don't feel inaccessible to me. This repetition, the implications of how fragmented and unreliable our memories are, and how that is explicitly portrayed through montage... It all comes together in a fun and funny way that rewards the viewer's efforts. I don't know how you can feel that upset by characters for whom play is literally their entire raison d'etre. And I also don't understand how something can be both too dry and too foolish at the same time. It's ridiculous to me. I already drone on and on about not going down the whole is it accessible or not route. I will just say... Maybe I was a sitting duck, but I loved this. There's just so much fun happening. I could even just watch them watching the camera, which is essentially their memories, sitting on that trunk forever and just have a great laugh the entire time. I saw someone refer to them with the ending part of replaying this story as the Marx sisters. And to me, that's fairly appropriate. And it's just a great time. I will say there's one part that lets me down. There is room to criticize it. I think, when Julie meets up with her previous nurse, her governess again at the house next door, that does convey some important information and it kind of rounds out that story like you were saying that Celine was the sick girl across the way. 
But primarily where it breaks down for me is this sequence is where I was most aware of the improvisations. You could see the seams of it a little bit. Well, I'm delighted to say that you're completely incorrect. <laughs> you can totally criticize, you know, whatever you feel like. But I loved that scene. Maybe it just felt even more real to me. So there was this delightful granny and they were so excited to see each other. And I did like that callback to this idea that there's been so much going on for such a long time. I say this, when we go back and watch it again, when they first meet, when she opens the door and the very first thing that Poopy says in response, the choice she made, you can see that Julie is taken off guard by it. And not as the character, but as the actor. And it broke the scene for me right there. Okay, I will definitely keep that in mind when we go back and watch it again. But it's a very minor quibble, I should say. It doesn't take me out of the film. And like I say, it imparts some important information in that scene. It's not a deal breaker, but it did knock me back a step just momentarily. Okay, got it. And I will make one last pump for even though it's over three hours, it certainly didn't feel that way. And I... Delighted to watch this any time again. But as this is all happening towards the end of this encounter, Celine, she exits the house in the same dazed manner, gets in the same taxi, has the same red handprint on her back. She has the same candy, which it turns out when they try to share it, this is pointing to the fact that they're not interchangeable. It doesn't work for Julie when she has Celine's candy. But now they've both been fully through the process. Now, with the candy, you mentioned the eat me, drink me part of things. There are overt Alice in Wonderland references at least twice. How do you assess the continuum of stories that this fits into? For instance, do you see similarities with things like daisies? That was my very first question for myself in the notes before we got started. I wondered if this would feel like daisies. And it does and it doesn't. It certainly doesn't feel anarchic in the same way because... Jacques Rivette is not fighting against the actual state. And it's funnier to me, even though Daisy's is incredibly funny too. Yeah, this has a sitcom pacing in places. It feels almost like a surrealist Laverne and Shirley more than art house. Especially with their physical comedy towards the end, definitely. I think the difference here is that the acting puts this one over the top if we're sort of comparing... I would say that Desperately Seeking Susan is the successor to this. That's one of the next things I was going to mention. I thought that would be on your list. So thank you again, Jacques Rivette, <laughs> for making that possible. And this is where I'm going to come to the Matrix reference. I see a lot of things happening here, especially when we talk about that duality that we examined in our Matrix episode. More than anything, it seems like their relationship is so unique. I'm not sure I've seen something exactly like it on screen. And as I mentioned earlier, I've seen no other Jacques Rivette, but you have. How would this fit within his work for you? It fits in exactly like you mentioned before. I think this is a great entry to his work. It's among the most palatable and fun and free-spirited the others tend to examine, if not trauma, conflict a little bit more than this and not in this breezy way. Although you could make the argument that out one is just 13 hours of acting exercises. That sounds great. <laughs> I think you would actually really like it. I'm sure. I And I certainly plan to watch it at some point. I just haven't had a spare 13 hours and I wasn't <laughs> sure how to break it up, you know? Just don't make me do it for a mini episode, okay? If you're going to go to one that's shorter and a little bit easier to digest than out one, from this one, I would recommend La Belle Noiseuse with Michel Piccoli. He's great in it, about an artist and his muse. I was thinking about something like The Umbrellas of Cherbourg that would be kind of fun if you think again about the theatricality aspect of it. I definitely see the relationship between those two, but the Jacques Demy, it feels like a very professional and slick product, whereas this is the more handmade gift you would get from your hippie aunt. <laughs> yes, that's true. It's not an Andy Warhol, I would right. say. <laughs> you know, there's just so much more interesting things going on, and there is a definite through line. So I don't want people to think that it's completely off the rails. I don't characterize it like that, even with the experimental nature. But the next morning... <laughs> that's true. 
How often would you go back to this house once you were invested in this story? I think at least a part of us wants to know why and wants to know what's happening. I didn't know it was going to turn into these incredibly high stakes of saving this little girl. That did catch me by surprise. Once you have that, how could you not? And there are all sorts of other cliffhangers happening. I want to know why the one girl faints when she gets to the doorway. What does she see? Well, do you see that as a larger metaphor for storytelling styles as they're deployed in movies or especially television? That's what it makes me think of, serial television. Which you know I hate, and I love (laughs) binge-watching because I do not want to have to wait a whole week, let alone a season, when you get to the end in May and then you've got to wait until September to figure out what's happened or who shot JR. So yeah, it probably is a metaphor for that, and I'm glad it's different these days. Well, I'm right there with you. You have to find out the end of the story. I definitely feel it, that compulsion. By this point, I am already eagerly anticipating each candy-fueled recap. In a way, they're the first podcasters. (laughs) Well, how would you pass the time, then, while you were waiting for me, for example, to go into the house and come back with whatever happened that day? Easy. You know the answer. I'm going to take a nap. (laughs) I'm going to eat some croissant, and then I'm going to try to be on time, like that scene I mentioned, when Julie realizes, oh, shoot, I'm supposed to be picking her up from the cab right now. It wouldn't be maddening to try to get through the day not knowing what was happening with such anticipation? I would somehow manage. With some warm doggies and a nice Paris breeze, yeah, I would be fine. Well, you already mentioned one of the ways that Julie passes the time during one of these episodes. This absurd turn that Julie puts in herself as the Mandragoran, taking Celine's place in the magic act... I love this sequence. It feels to me like this would have been a central scene if Jenna Rollins had directed the killing of a Chinese bookie instead of John Cassavetes. Good point. It feels straight out of Marlena Dietrich to me as well. Yeah, she turns the tables on them in such a way during her confessional part of the breakdown in that scene. She's insulting them and challenging them. It's so much fun to watch her seemingly grow right before our eyes. And I do still think it was all planned, at least in her mind. I think it's acting with a capital A. They do spend fun times together, too. They have this caper, and here's where the Phantoms reference in the subtitle comes in, these bodysuits and roller skates. We saw a little bit of this style echoed in Judex that we just watched a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned a second ago the influences, both before and that this influenced after, And here, Rivette seems like he's paying homage all the way back to Louis Fouillard. All they're missing are those hip uh, daggers for their bodysuits. And not hip daggers in terms of cool daggers, but literal daggers on the hip. Yeah. Everybody needs to go watch Judex. I also wanted to talk a second here about the predominance of the number four as a symbol. How did that strike you? I definitely see that occurring. But it starts to get a little bit muddy when we talk about the other combinations. So I'm intrigued to see where the fours take you. Well, they take me to a very specific place. First and foremost, it feels like a bit of an odd choice. It's kind of uncommon, the number four. You see three a lot, seven a lot, four, not so much. But in this, there is often a division into fours, or at least the discussion of it. The seasons, the elements, the parts of the day. The tarot card reading layout mimicking the four cardinal points of the compass. And the cumulative effect of all that leads me to one overarching conclusion. And this just could be how I read it. I may be way off base. But what it suggests to me is Rivette's stock in trade. You have the usual dimensions of length, width, and height. What is the fourth dimension? Time. The thing that's most important to him. You just blew my mind, babe. (laughs) Well, I'll be thinking about that the next time we go back to watch as well. What I would say is, I don't think that you're off base. I don't feel like there's another number happening. And at most, maybe you're giving it another more interesting thematic element that other people haven't explored as much. Uh, Yeah, I'm kind of a big podcasting deal. Yeah, I know. (laughs) But anyway, one of the places this four turns up, when they run out of candy... They hack their way back in with this potion they make, transitioning from stage magic to magic with a K, free jacking all around in there like Mick Jagger. Uh, I've never seen that, so I'll take your word for it. (laughs) Okay. 
Is Emilio Estevez in that too? It's actually more of a master shake joke than anything else. Okay. But doing this, let's talk about their bold plan to infiltrate this ghost house and finally liberate this young girl that's in danger. It affected me a certain way. I was wondering if it felt the same to you. Do you see this as a commentary on the line between being an audience member and performer in the play? Because specifically what it made me wonder is how often when you, Erica, specifically read your Agatha Christie stories, do you feel the desire, at least on first reading, to influence the trajectory of the story? What if you were able to actually inhabit the story and solve or even prevent the crime? Okay, isn't it now ingrained in us, you and me and everybody else, that if we try to prevent the crime or go back in history, or make a change, we end up making some much bigger blunder. (laughs) Like, tomorrow I will wake up and scald myself with tea. So speaking of Agatha Christie, though, the only thing it makes me want to do is go shake some old ladies so that they will tell everything they know instead of dropping inscrutable hints. Maybe that's why I like these Gladys Mitchell, Mrs. Bradley stories, because she actually injects herself in on occasion, has committed crimes. Well, with this successful rescue of the girl, the usually, quote-unquote, of the opening, it finally comes to full fruition. And this has always been one of my favorite ideas about storytelling. You see it used in science fiction more often, I think, but this idea that there are so many ways a story can go, every decision that a character makes is a point from which other infinite resolutions can be spawned. As indicated by our title card yet again, but the next morning, dot, 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 those ellipses being so important. One of the things I love about this finale, once they are in the middle of attempting to manipulate the outcome of the house story, I love how the real Celine and Julie are kind of hapless as each one occupies the role of Angèle, the nurse. They know generally what they're supposed to do, but not specifically how they are supposed to do it. They don't necessarily remember every fine detail. And I think it appeals to you, too, because that's where a lot of the literal slapstick comedy happens. Like I've said before, we see them again hustling to, oh, wait, I've missed my cue, essentially. I'm supposed to be over here talking about this and then flubbing their lines, which is really funny. And ultimately, what it brings me back to is I think back to that scene with Celine and her friends around the table that we talked about previously. And it makes me recast that in my mind a little bit. I have to reconsider how they think about her and what they would have to say if they saw this. Because like you mentioned, it turned out the very first story she told was true, at least mostly. And this most outlandish story is actually true this time. So has everything been true all along? And think back to a moment when Celine has gone looking for Julie in the library and her library friend says, I think that she's gone and she's never coming back. That ends up being true as well. Well, I've got a question here that I think is right up your alley, actually. We've talked a little bit about the nature of theater versus cinema. The most obvious thing that comes to mind is that with theater, even though you may put on a hundred, a thousand different performances of a show, each one of them is at least slightly unique. It could be the audience. It could be the performers that day. But there is the potential for each performance to be different. And I feel like that ties directly to what I was saying about every decision within a story potentially resulting in infinite new stories. With a film, though, it's the same projected experience every time. So what do you think Rivette is trying to tell us about the nature of relationship between those media? Well, in this instance, they do have some power within their given framework. They do affect change. So I think it's saying that the audience really is itching to make a difference. I actually come down on the flip side of that, because I think it says more about what Rivet thinks of the nature of authorship having little to do with the audience. You can do everything you can to keep that creative process vital and alive until you commit it to film and it becomes an artifact, a record of just one of the potential outcomes. Interesting. And then Pauline Kael stands up and (laughs) slags you off, I guess. Okay, well, they successfully spirit this young girl away. And then, though, the one time we see the other inhabitants of the house out in the real world, when Celine and Julie are literally boating, did you find that unsettling or menacing? Was there a hint of the possibility that this was a two-way street? 
that these ghosts could interfere with or intrude upon Celine and Julie's world the same way Celine and Julie did them? Well, I guess I thought about the other meaning for aller en bateau, which is basically to be taken for a ride or the whole shaggy dog story. <laughs> so it does seem like we're getting to the bit of an end of a shaggy dog story. So I didn't think so. Once we know their ghosts, their faces are green, I thought of them more as a tableau, not in a folk horror way of being able to then affect our quote unquote real life. Well, then that being said, I found this to be a very satisfying ending to the film. How about you? Yes, very much for me, because what I was hoping would happen did happen. We see the roles reversed, ultimately, and the whole chase starts over again. Yeah, even going back to that comparison between film and theater, even as a static artifact, a completed film that will not change, it still manages to capture and convey that potential energy, it's a springboard into another of these myriad possibilities, and your imagination is free to pick it up from there. Because Celine and Julie Go Boating 2 could be entirely different. Even more to the point, Celine and Julie Go Boating 1B could be entirely different. Absolutely. Well, I think we've wrapped it up. Did we cover everything that you wanted to cover? Certainly for me. Okay, well, how about a recommendation? What do you have for us this time? I'm choosing my favorite recent monument to the joys of friendship, and in this case, female friendship. And I picked The Spy Who Dumped Me from 2018, directed by Susanna Fogel with Mila Kunis and Kate McKinnon. It's about two women who set off on a grand adventure to essentially save the world after one is dumped by her boyfriend who turns out to be a spy. Let me put it to you this way. Would you rather die never having been to Europe, or would you rather die having been to Europe? <laughs> now, you know, you, Cole Rolaine, know that I am a gigantic fan of this movie, and it is incredibly fun and hilarious and thrilling and hilarious and everything I want. Yeah, I have to say, I don't know that I was the most enthused when you convinced me to sit down and watch with you, but Kate McKinnon is just undeniable. And you're right, this movie is very funny, beginning to end. I absolutely know that Celine and Julie would have been down for this adventure, especially the Cirque du Soleil stuff. So how about you? Well, I am going with a slightly darker descendant of this, and I have chosen Mulholland Drive from 2001, directed by David Lynch and starring Laura Elena Haring and Naomi Watts. I wondered why we didn't mention Mulholland Drive when we were talking about what came after this. Yeah, I was saving it for this. It's about a woman who is left amnesiac after a car crash and takes refuge in a Los Angeles apartment, only to be found there by a young woman who has come to L.A. to be an actress, and together they set out to unravel the mystery of her true identity. And there are a number of things that tie this to Celine and Julie, I feel like. The two women at the center of the story, obviously, and the way their personalities do or don't fuse together to create interchangeable characters. There are iconic cabaret performances in each. You look at the way Julie's breakdown as the Mandragoran is echoed by Betty's audition. And Lynch, too, is commenting on repetition and identity and the nature of performance. It comes across decidedly differently, obviously, more sinister for one thing, even though I guess a young girl being potentially murdered is the impetus for the finale of Celine and Julie. But there is definitely that same shared through the looking glass connection and more than a few surface similarities to make these an illuminating double feature. Plus, both of our recommendations share Justin Theroux. Oh, that's right. Which we didn't plan. I guess you would call that a Theroux line. <laughs> Now I'm going to throw you through the window. <laughs> so once again, that's two great recommendations. The Spy Who Dumped Me and Mulholland Drive. And that brings us to the end of episode 149. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. 
We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Spencer Seams, Jesse Athey, Keith Rich, Matt Gasteyer, and Andy Wolverton. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. You can find our show on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. We want to say a special thank you very much to Matt Larson, who left us a very kind review via iTunes Sweden. And also thank you to the nice anonymous person that left us a five-star rating on iTunes US recently. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services... We would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 